for English. One of them was Welsh and seven were Scots. So quite a, quite a mix. The majority of 14 had been captured following the surrender of Carlisle in December 45, with the remaining three caught in the bloody aftermath of Culloden. As Stephen said, I lived nearby in the, two, in the early 2000s. I was quite at first intrigued with, um, with the, what had happened to these Scots in the centre of London, but then, then more why there were so, so many Englishmen uh, in this uh, who had been executed as well. And um, really the sort of England's involvement in the 45 goes against the sort of later Whig and Hanoverian propaganda, which kind of cast the campaign as Scottish Catholic Highlanders versus the government. Um, and here is a slide, which isn't moving, sorry. Yeah, here's, here's a slide which, which um, a lovely print from September 1745, which uh, a, month, a month after the uh, Royal Standard was raised, which, which kind of shows you the sort of propaganda that was being sent out. You've got um, Prince Charles in a coach being driven by Louis XIV and Pope Benedict with the devil hitching a ride on the back, um, supported by a Highland army, trampling a lawyer with a copy of the Magna Carta in his hand and being led by a monk with uh, Inquisition written on his flag. So absolutely no subtlety whatsoever here. Um, as we now know, it's, it's now clear really that it wasn't a Highland army, only a third of the Jacobite troops were from the Highlands. Um, half were from the northeast of Scotland, remainder from the lowlands. And it wasn't a Catholic army either. The majority up to, I think about 70% were Protestant Episcopalians, but so there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of propaganda here, um, but it's, all, it's worth looking in this talk, really who the government decided to execute. And out of about 120 uh, men who were executed after the 45, if you exclude deserters from government regiments, that drops to about 85. And out, out of that, 27 were from the Manchester regiment. That's about 30% of the total and around half of all executed officers. And this was from a regiment that only existed for a month and probably had about 250 troops at its most. So it's, it's worth really asking why, why that was the case. Um, but overall, I think the 17 martyrs of Kennington, because with a mix, their mix of nationalities, ages, and religions, are a good case study and really an argument for the, the more complicated and nuanced picture of Jacobite support. So here we have a list of the first batch, yeah, as I'm calling them, of executions. Um, you all know your history. The Jacobite army entered England early November 1745. It soon captured Carlisle. It left a heavy, its heavy baggage and a garrison of about 100 men there for on its march south. And in Manchester, an English regiment was formed mainly recruited from Catholic towns like Preston and Wigan in Lancashire uh, and surrounding counties rather than Manchester itself. But many of the, the regiment's officers were from Manchester. These officers paid recruits themselves. They had uh, themselves, they had tartan sashes and waistcoats and gold laced hats, but most of their troops had little beyond white cockades in their hats. The majority of the Manchester regiment rank and file were Lancashire Catholics. But again, most of these, most of their officers were either Anglicans or non-jurors uh, who, along with the Episcopalians, had never recognized William and Mary and their Hanoverian successors. So I'll go through uh, some of the, uh, the martyrs involved from Manchester now, one by one. First, first we have here uh, on, the, on the left is a posthumous Francis. Um, on the right is his older brother, John, who also fought in the 45 uh, in the French army and escaped uh, before Culloden. Uh, Francis Townley was 37 year old, tough talking veteran of French military servants from a notable Roman Catholic and Jacobite family in Burnley. Um, you can go and visit Townley Hall, there, there's quite a, which is still there owned by the council and it's, it's well worth doing. Um, he was the Colonel of the regiment 
Thomas Theodorus Deacon uh, enlisted as a lieutenant, but rose to captain. And some reports say he was considered for the regiment's leadership. He was a 20 year old medical student, the eldest son of Dr. Thomas Deacon, shown here. Deacon, uh, his father was a bishop in the non during Orthodox British Church. It had a tiny congregation, but it was strongly Jacobite. Several, I think most of the men in this small congregation ended up joining the Manchester Regiment. Certainly, uh, Thomas's two younger brothers served, um, Robert Renatus, you can see here, and 15-year-old Charles Cunning Deacon, and both of them died as a, as a result of this. So Bishop Deacon lost three of his sons to this, uh, to the 45. Um, once considered for the regiment's, regiment's leadership, the 51-year-old Welshman David Thomas Morgan was a barrister. He acted as a counsellor to Prince Charles, and he arranged warrants to seize arms and horses. He was a high Anglican, and he'd been a legal advisor to the Dukes of Beaufort and a member of the pro-Jacobite Tory political grouping, the Independent Electors of Westminster. The next is Captain Andrew Blyde. He was a 26-year-old Roman Catholic from Yorkshire, and he was the estate agent to the 9th Duke of Norfolk. Um, in, the, in the regiment, he commanded a pioneer regiment who fixed roads for the Jacobite artillery and baggage trains. And the Duke of Norfolk went down to London during the 45, either to prove his loyalty or perhaps to plead for Blyde's life, or, or perhaps both. Um, apologies for the next slide. Uh, it's a terrible Victorian print, which shows James Dawson. Uh, he never wore a kilt, of course. Um, he was a 27-year-old son of a Manchester apothecary or doctor uh, who was also a, a reputed Jacobite, his father. So he was an Anglican. He received quite a strong Jacobite education at Salford Grammar School before studying at St. John's College, Cambridge. At Derby, he um, made a rousing speech to, to recruiters suggesting new recruits would be kindly entertained with present pay and good quarters, receiving arms and accoutrements and everything fit to complete a gentleman and soldier. And for their further encouragement, each would receive five guineas when they reached London with a crown to drink King James's health. And of course, uh, Derby was as far as the uh, regiment marched. The next is Captain George Fletcher. He was a 24 year old Anglican, a successful and wealthy linen draper. Um, his mother was from a landowning family. Um, and he paid 150 guineas for his own commission and later offered money to deter deserters from the regiment. And he was, even, he was joined by a liveried servant who carried his gun. So obviously uh, quite a wealthy gent. The next um, is Captain James Bradshaw, who was a 28 year old Anglican, cousin of John Bradshaw of Darcy Labour, who later became the High Sheriff of Lancashire. He worked in London before returning to Manchester on the death of his father, a prosperous owner of textile warehouses. He left the regiment before the fall of Carlisle, um, joining Lord Elko's horse, and he fought at Clifton Moor, Falkirk and Culloden. So he was definitely, with by a country mile, the most martial Mancunian. The two next ones are the Lieutenant John Berwick, 30-year-old linen draper turned malt dealer from uh, Ridgely in Staffordshire. Nicknamed the Duke, he um, stole a horse for his own use during the retreat from Derby. Uh, his fellow Lieutenant Thomas Chadwick was a Manchester-born 25-year-old son of a, a wealthy silk boiler in the town. But he seems to have time to be a gentleman of leisure. And when at Lancaster, he, he delighted the troops by playing the Jacobite tune entitled May the 29th, or the King shall enjoy his own again on the parish church organ, an action that was held against him at his trial. The adjutant of the regiment was Thomas Siddle. Now, Siddle was a successful barber, uh, 36 years old, and a wig maker from Manchester, whose own father had been executed during the, the 15. Um, He's described in reports as a hardened villain with an extraordinary attachment to the Stuarts, and certainly he prayed that his own, his five children would tread, tread the same dangerous steps he had. He was also a member of Deacon's Orthodox British Church. Now, the prisoners of the 45 notes that the Manchester Regiment was treated with a ferocity that, which indicated that its degree of culpability was held to be higher than of any other in the Jacobite army. 
somehow Englishmen and Anglicans committing high treason was far worse than Scots doing so. Um, and this, the regiment's reputation has also been treated quite harshly over the years with reports calling them vagabonds and the sweepings of Manchester. And there's numerous derogatory tales of desperation, embarrassment and bankruptcy associated with their enlistment. Most of them, if not all, are without foundations. And you get similar slurs, of course, towards the, the Scottish martyrs. Here's the, here's the regiment of, uh, here's the uh, signatures of most of the regiment, uh, which will show you how they, they chose to spell their own names because there's quite a debate about some of it. In truth, this regiment and all of the officers were volunteers and many had very strong ties of loyalty to the Stuarts. Um, John Preble suggested that the patrician Colonel Townley would never have recognized his fellow officers as gentlemen, but at least one of them uh, was a very close relation. And others were man and men of rank who represented the town's emerging middle classes and who, of course, whose wealth paid for this regiment. Many of the Anglican officers worshipped at the Collegiate Church, uh, now at Manchester Cathedral, which was quite unusual. It was very pro-Jacobite. And one of its chaplains, uh, the Reverend John Clayton, fell to his knees in the street to pray for Prince Charles as he approached the town. Um, as I said, government didn't like Anglicans uh, being Jacobites. Um, and this, this is a, another one of these uh, propaganda prints which shows um, Thomas Kopek, who was a Manchester Regiment's chaplain and a Protestant, of course, being ordained as Bishop of Carlisle by the Pope, Prince Charles uh, and the, the devil. Um, so again, this is a deliberate confusion that equated Jacobitism with Catholicism, just to, to scare the population of England, really. Um, so the Jacobite army retreated from Derby, as we all know, on the 6th of December. It reached Carlisle again on the way north on the 19th after the skirmish at Clifton. Townley uh, was awarded governorship of the town with the governorship of the castle given to John Hamilton. On the 20th, the main ar army moved back to Scotland, leaving a garrison of almost 400 in Carlisle. The majority of those 274 were Scottish. Uh, order to remain, which, which led to certainly understandable resentment. By this stage, um, only 114 men of the Manchester Regiment had remained, the rest had deserted. So uh, the majority of this reg the, the garrison was Scots. And the garrison fell within two days after the Duke of Cumberland had, had, had got some cannon from Whitehaven. Um, the surrender on the 30th of December Seems to have been John Hamilton's call. Townley certainly had stated it was better to die by the sword than fall into the hands of these damned Hanoverians. And others urged a fight. However, looking at details, it does appear that many believed that they would be safe from execution and, had, and had, some had been promised protection on a French, by the, the French cartel. So the following Scots martyrs were captured at Carlisle. Um, first, we have... Um, 56-year-old Captain John Hamilton of Sandstone. He was the factor to the Duke of Gordon's estates in Huntley. He came from a Jacobite family in long service with the Dukes of Gordon. He was an Episcopalian, but his brother was a Benedictine priest. Um, he had a, a small estate just north of Huntley Castle, uh, of Huntley Castle, which is now the Huntley Castle Hotel. And like Townley, he had a military background. He had served abroad with the Dutch and Tsar's forces before the 15 came back to fight in the 15 and had to escape back to Holland afterwards. During the 45, he helped raise 100 men and forced a glass of wine down the throat of Aberdeen's Lord Provost when he refused to drink to the Prince's health. Captain Donald MacDonald was the 25-year-old nephew of Alexander MacDonald of Kepik. His mother was Kepik's sister. He was, according to reports, a man of great spirit and resolution who, when asked his name in court, invited the judge to go ask his mother. In, Prince, uh, in prison, he joked with his jailers, offering to play the bagpipes and dance a Highland reel if he was unlocked from his chains. Captain Alexander Leith was a 40-year-old farmer, born at Ruthen to the north of Huntley, and by 1745, he was farming to the south of Huntley at Calithi. He was a Roman Catholic from a Jacobite family and also a friend of John Hamilton's, and he, had John, he joined Gordon of Glenbucket's regiment. 
Lieutenant Walter Ogilvy of the Duke of Perth's regiment was a 21 year old Episcopalian from the southwest of Banff. Uh, he's recorded as a writer, but doesn't appear on the signet lists. I think he was a student at the time. And I found out quite a bit about Lieutenant James Nicholson, uh, a 38 year old vintner and coffee shop owner from the shore in Leith. Um, his family had once had an estate in East Lothian. And although some of his six children are baptized in the established church, I also found them in Episcopalian records being baptized by none other than the great Bishop Robert Forbes, author of The Lion in Mourning. He joined Gad com Gad's company in the Duke of Perth's regiment. And bizarrely, his eldest son would inherit an Aberdeenshire baronetcy from a distant cousin. Uh, I hope to sort of put all the information I found uh, in print at some point. So um, the 14 men captured at Carlisle traveled by horse to London. Before their arrival, the government had helped prime the, the population with pulpit speeches, pamphlets, and the not uncoincidental return of injured, badly injured government troops, including coat survivors from Preston Pans. So they entered the capital on four open wagons with a coach for Townley. Their arms were bound, so they couldn't shield themselves from missiles thrown by a very angry London mob. The remaining three martyrs were caught after the Battle of Culloden and shipped down on the three week journey from Inverness to Tilbury. These included the Manchester man, uh, James Bradshaw, who'd been singled out for his former regiment. Bradshaw left a harrowing account of the treatment he'd received after his capture and on the ship. The remaining two martyrs uh, captured after Culloden were Sir John Wedderburn and Captain Andrew Wood. Wedderburn was the fifth baronet of blackness on the right here, 42-year-old um, Episcopalian lawyer, factor to the Duke of Douglas's Forfeiture Estates. He served as the Prince's excise collector for Perth and Angus. And I think his, his supposed poverty seems to have been exaggerated in reports, but um, in, a, in one of these historical ironies, his, his sons, uh, one of whom fought with him in 45, emigrated to Jamaica, becoming oppressive plantation owners one had an illegitimate son with a slave girl, and that's Robert Wedderburn on the left, who moved to London, became a radical campaigner, and actually gave a speech on the site of the Kennington Gallows. Captain Andrew Wood was a 23-year-old Glaswegian gentleman, otherwise shoemaker, who served in John Roy Stewart's regiment. He was a Presbyterian, um, which may be less rare when, than we think, uh, and his father had served on the government side in the 15. He was found guilty despite his defense noting good conduct towards prisoners and a petition and signed affidavit, affidavit from clemency from Glasgow's Lord Provost. All the officers um, went to trial. The trials were mostly short. They relied on witnesses, soldier witnesses, many of whom had turned uh, King's evidence and at least one of the martyrs refused to do the same. And suspiciously similar statements were given against most of the accused. Only one Manchester officer withdrew his not guilty plea, but the second batch of Scots would all do so, asking for the mercy of the court. A couple of the officers made a fight for it. Townley's defence relied on his French King's Commission and a position at the top of the French cartel, but it failed. James Bradshaw claimed he had lost his mind during uh, following his wife and children's early deaths. But the five-hour trial found his being strapped down at night, the actions of a persistent sleepwalker. Bradshaw later explained, I think it every man's business by all lawful means to live as long as he can. And with this view, I made a defense upon my trial, which I thought might possibly do me service. I think Bradshaw's uh, quite a fascinating character, actually. His scaffold speech is, is really heartfelt and also quite tragic. Um, Wedderburn's six, six hour trial claimed a defense that he'd been forced to enlist and fruitfully was returned home from the regiment but some of his own signed receipts conflicted with evidence and he was also found guilty. Uh, after passing sentence, the manner of death was normally the judge's prerogative, but the only penalty for high treason was set, that prisoners would be carried from this place to the prison from whence you came, and from thence you must be taken to a place of execution where you must be hanged by your necks, but not until you are dead, for you must be cut down alive. Your eye, heads must be severed from your body your bowels must be taken out and burnt before your faces, and your body must be divided into four quarters, and these must be at the king's disposal. 
um, absolutely uh, horrible, especially in the mid 18th century when London was supposed to be a rapidly civilizing city. Um, before this, the government, the, the Jacobite soldiers, uh, officers had been housed in the new or county jail in Borough High Street in Southwark. And to the fury of their opponents, they were first well treated uh, with luxuries often provided by sympathizers. Jailers welcomed wealthy guests and, and made a good profit from them. This changed after the guilty verdict when they were fettered by day and chained to the floor at night. Many remained upbeat, although emotions were obviously raised when they had visits from relations, Chadwick by his father, and Nicholson was, was visited daily by his wife and 10-year-old daughter, Margaret. David Morgan, who's generally maligned in contemporary reports, was, was visited daily by a loving wife and daughter. There was also support from the clergy. Um, Non-Jurian priests assisted the Anglicans and Episcopalians, whose church was in full communion with the English non-jurors. And the last sacrament was given to many by the non-Jurian priest, Reverend John Creek, a staunch Jacobite previously arrest arrested for treasonous activities in London. Um, and the slide here shows a uh, jeweled miniature which, which, uh, of James III, which remained in the Creek family for many years and was sold recently at uh, Lyon and Turnbull. Sadly, uh, it was too expensive for me. Um, the Glaswegian, Andrew Wood, was visited by, by a Presbyterian minister who refused to administer the Holy Sacrament to him unless he repented. Wood noted that this reverend set upon me with great vehemence. He charged me with the most horrid of crimes, of impiously embrewing my hands in Christian blood, murdering his majesty's subject, and of rebelling against the wisest, most just, most pious, and best of kings in favor of, popish, in favor of a popish pretender. Wood, uh, not surprisingly afterwards, converted to the non juring Church of England. Um, Executions took place at the Surrey Gallows in Kennington, um, which is on ground now occupied by the St. Mark's Church, which you see on the right, um, opposite Oval Tube Station, if you know London. It was, the, it was Crown property and it belonged to the Duchy of Cornwall. And to this day, the pub overlooking the site is named the Hanover Arms. The executions are all fairly similar. So I'll just, I'll start off with the, the, the Manchester Regiment. They, they were walking, uh, six o'clock on the morning of 12th of August, 1746. Alcohol was available, but David Morgan was more concerned with his coffee getting cold whilst he was unfettered. Around 10 a.m., the men were tied on their backs to sledges when I suppose all hope of a reprieve must surely have vanished. Um, here's a, here's a, a Dr. Cameron being drawn, just which shows you the, the sledge. Um, and they were drawn to the, the gallows, and that's where the drawn in hanged, drawn and quartered comes from. So it should really be drawn, hanged and quartered. Um, the, uh, the sledge was drawn by three shire horses. Executioner, you can see uh, on the sledge there, had a, a, a drawn sword overlooking it. Troops guarded the procession to Kennington. They arrived there around 11 o'clock, and the officers ascended the steps to a scaffold, which was raised to allow the, the large crowds a good view. The scaffold took the form of a triangular structure with three hanging beams, the infamous triple tree. And beneath the gallows, piles of sticks had been set alight. There were no clergymen present, but Morgan, uh, David Morgan said a few prayers and later the Scot Walter Ogilvie would read from a non-during prayer book. The men gave their final speeches and then handed them over. Some threw copies to the crowd where officials scrabbled to grab them. There was a, a difference, I suppose, there was a difference between the dying declarations shown, shown uh, sold openly on the day, which were a valuable source of money to relatives, and the actual scaffold speeches, which were treasonable and printed secretly by sympathetic printers, of which there were quite a few in, in London. The executioner of both the, mar the martyrs and the rebel lords at Tower Hill was John Thrift, and like most hangmen, he was universally despised. Um, this uh, print shows uh, the ir irony uh, of a situation where, where Thrift was himself sentenced to um, murder uh, in 1750. And he's being visited by the ghosts of, of his victims, in including uh, the nine officers at 
Kennington who are hanging from the, the triple tree. After the men said their speeches, their heads were covered with caps and the noose was put around their necks. With his last breath, Thomas Deacon shouted, God save King James III. They were then turned off the scaffold and after hanging for only three minutes, their clothes were removed and they were cut down and left in a pile. Townley was the first to be taken to the executioner's table and his body showed signs of life, so Thrift gave him several blows on the chest. He was still alive, so he finally cut his throat. Thrift then cut off the genitals, opened the body up, removing bowels, innards and the heart, which were all thrown into a hissing fire beneath. But not everything reached the fire. Uh, one of the crowd, it's reported, ate a piece of Townley's flesh to show his loyalty and one of the Scots livers was taken from the fire and later broiled and eaten. Whether out of derision or to imitate a, Campbell is a cannibal is not known, but he was much displeased both at its banquet and taste. Finally, heads were severed by a butcher's cleaver and held up to the crowd. Some in the crowd, in the large crowd there, gave a, a shout, but overall the response uh, was recorded as muted. One source recalls that Generally speaking, the fate of these gallant gentlemen excited a, deser a deserved and laudable commiseration, and the same mob who had hooted and derided them as they passed to their trials witnessed their closing scenes with, at least with decent sympathy, if not with marks of positive admiration. A contemporary tale notes that James Dawson's fiancée was present in a coach and died of shock at seeing his execution. Uh, of course, it was naturally, it was the day of their, it was due to have been the day of their wedding. But certainly Thomas Deacon's 16-year-old younger brother, Charles, then awaiting his sentence, was present to see his brother being executed. The second grouping of executions occurred on the 22nd of August. MacDonald and Nicholson were hanged in Highland dress, along with Walter Ogilvy. And they were executed in the same manner with one exception. This time they were allowed to hang for 15 minutes instead of three before being cut down. This was done to prevent the, the men still being alive when cut open as the horrid circumstances of the former execution were too much, even for the feelings of the insensitive crowd, which usually assembles on such occasions. Nevertheless, it was recorded that Don MacDonald and Ogilvy being strong young men died very hard. By the time of the last batch of executions, the mood in London had changed. A growing disgust over the severity had led several London aldermen on both political sides to sign a petition for leniency. However, it was not to be, and on 28th of November, the final five officers were executed. These were John Wedderburn, John Hamilton, Captains James Bradshaw, formerly of the Manchester Regiment, Alexander Leith and Andrew Wood. Wood raised a last toast to Prince Charles before being tied to the sledge. The five were meant to be six. Just before being bound to the sledge, the Perth shoemaker, Lin James Lindsay, was reprieved, hugging his friends, speechless in floods of tears. The heads of Townley and Fletcher were fixed to spikes on the top of Temple Bar on the 12th of August, 1746, where they remained until 1772 when Fletcher's fell during a storm. Townley's came down shortly after and was rescued by the family and became a, a sort of semi-relic within the family until buried in the, in the, the vault in Burnley in 1947. They have a paper mache one at Townley Hall that I scared my children with, which, uh, which they won't forgive me for. Uh, here's just some detail from this rather gory uh, print that records... On the 18th of September, the heads of Thomas Deacon and Thomas Siddle were placed on top of the Manchester Exchange. Siddle's father's head had been rotting there since 1716 and had only been removed the previous year when the Jacobites had taken the town. The two Teds didn't stay there for long. They were stolen by a teenage medical student in 1749. Um, the heads of Thomas Chadwick and John Berwick were pickled in spirits and sent to the English gate at Carlisle, which you see on the left, and John Hamilton's would follow to go on the Scots gate next to the Manchester Regiment's chaplain, Thomas Coppock. The Kennington Marshes were all buried, except Townley, in St George's Fields in Bloomsbury, also known, in, known as the Nelson's Burying Ground. 
it was popular with non-jurors and the uh, non-juring Bishop Gordon is buried there uh, on that's his tomb on the right. For many years until 1972, a flow of tribute was anonymously left every year with the words in the memory of the brave Jacobites who were murdered for their beliefs. And very happily in 2015, the 1745 Association added a plaque within the churchyard, which is a fitting memory to the martyrs, which you can see here. Um, Francis Townley's body was buried in old St Pancras churchyard, uh, where his brother's 1750s painting, which you know you can see here, notes his disgraceful murder. It's unlikely there was ever a gravestone noting uh, Francis's mangled remains, and he seems to have actually gone into a vault. The executions at Kennington led to a short upsurge in Jacobite activity and support, the, I suppose the opposite of what was in, intended. So Walter Scott suggested that the horror and loathing inspired by so many bloody punishments had really boosted the cause. And this print um, shows the Reverend John Henley, who certainly wasn't dressed up uh, with a Highland bonnet, um, only two days after the last executions. Um, his London sermon expressed Jacobite sympathies and opposition to the reprisals in Scotland and led to him spending two weeks in custody. Elsewhere in London, a Roman Catholic chapel in Lincoln Inn's field said prayers for Townley and Blyde. And in Manchester, Dr. Che Dr. Deacon's church saw a huge surge in membership. Morgan's death boosted the membership of the independent electors of Westminster. And in 1747, the year after, amazingly, London's Lord Mayor sent a secret letter of support to Prince Charles. In 1750, Charles met the English Jacobites in Pall Mall on his, sec on his secret London visit, where he converted to the non-during church. But as before, the, his English supporters wouldn't commit without French support. Manchester continued to celebrate the Jacobite holy days of the 29th of May and 10th of June but Shrewsbury was punished for a Jacobite demonstration in 1750, being chosen for the execution of the last Jacobite martyr, the, Jack, the last English Jacobite martyr, Thomas Anderson, in December 1752. In Scotland, the Jacobite threat was harshly policed with military might and brutal repression. Property and cattle were confiscated. Catholic and non juring chapels were burnt. Legislation undermined Jacobite support, removing the feudal rights of parish heritors, disarming the population and forbidding Highland dress, and laws severely limited non-during worship for both clergy and laymen. The Jacobite aristocracy died at Tower Hill with the relative luxury of a swift axe blow. Most of the rank and file taken at Carlisle were executed at York, Penrith, and Carlisle, including six out of the seven Manchester sergeants. Was that Kennington, was that Kennington, beautiful, 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 gorgeous. Really? Yeah, Kennington was chosen for the officers of the unhappy <laughs> Manchester Regiment, men who stand in proud defiance against England's no show in the 45. They died because the government was desperate to play down the lever of popular Jacobite support in England especially from Anglicans who came from odd places like Manchester, which had grown very rapidly without, political, without proper political representation. Kennington was also chosen for a selection of significant Scots. Governor of Carlisle, John Hamilton, clearly merited a death on the London stage, Hi. as did the Prince's excise collector to John Wedderburn. MacDonald was doomed by being Keppock's nephew, Hello, sorry, I've un unmuted. I don't know where I was there. Um, I'll just I'll just go back. Uh, Kenning Kennington was chosen for the officers of the unhappy Manchester Regiment, men who stand in proud defiance against England's no-show in the 45. They died because the government was desperate to play down the level of popular Jacobite support in England, especially from Anglicans and also especially in odd places like Manchester, which had grown very rapidly without any proper political representation. 
Kennington was also chosen for a selection of significant Scots, like the governor of Carlisle, who clearly, uh, John Hamilton, who clearly merited a death on the London stage, as did the Prince's excise collector, Sir John Wedderburn. Macdonald was doomed by being Keppoch's nephew, and others are less clear, but retribution generally fell on those who, who beat up or funded recruits, like Glasgow's Captain Wood, who paid for a company out of his own pocket. Although several of the martyrs had attempted to avoid the noose by claiming coercion, with their motives later blackened, it's pretty clear they were all enthusiastic Jacobites. When past any hope of a reprieve, their touching and defiant scaffold speeches note a strong loyalty and sense of duty to, towards King James, with kind, even gushing words for the conduct and character of Prince Charles. Their speeches show a, a Brit bitter enmity towards the bribery and corruption within in the Hanoverian government, while others confirm the falsity of the proposed Jacobite no quarter orders after Culloden and detail the barbarities. Yeah. Bradshaw, again, the pretended Duke of Cumberland and those under his command are beasts whose inhumanity has exceeded anything I could have imagined in a country where the name of God is spoken. Captain Wood also expanded on the loss Scotland had suffered from the, a base and scandalous union, which also shows another facet within the broad church of Jacobite support. So why martyrs? Well, well one cont contemporary report noticed the, noted that the officers believed they were suffering in a righteous and glorious cause. And Thomas Deacon's scaffold speech elaborated. Yes. The deluded and infatuated vulgar will no doubt brand my death with all the infamy and ignorance that prejudice can suggest. But the thinking few who have not quite forsaken their duty to God and their king will, and be persuaded to look upon it as being little inferior to martyrdom itself. While I am about to fall sacrifice to the resentment and revenge of the Elector of Hanover and all these unhappy miscreants who have openly espoused the cause of a German foreign German usurper and withdrawn their allegiance from their only rightful, lawful and native sovereign, King James III. And I'd like to leave you today with just one last quote, again from the Reverend Creek to the mother of Captain James Dawson. It is with the greatest concern that I have obliged myself to comply with the last request of your dear son, that I would acquaint you with his death, which, as also that of his fellow sufferers, was in such a heroic and Christian manner, attended with such exemplary patience, resignation, fortitude and courage, that they have thereby done themselves honour, which, which will live forever. And I hope today, 2000, uh, sorry, 275 years later, I've helped in a very small way with their honour still being remembered. Thank you. <laughs>